Hi, I'm Ken Graham with the National Weather Service. Thank you for watching today. Our office, the National Weather Service in Slidell, Louisiana, we cover 22 parishes and we cover eight counties up in Mississippi, and this is our coverage area here. Today, I'm going to focus on some training. We're going to talk about hurricanes today, and we give those training sessions around the parishes, the state agencies, and federal agencies, and cities, and e even in the community we do training sessions. So I'm happy to be here today to talk about hurricanes. This presentation is going to focus on it's gotchas, things that, that might get you, things that you might not know and you can't necessarily jump on the internet to find out, some different type of things for you today. So I hope you enjoy this. We're going to look through some slides, and the first thing we're going to talk about is hazard communication. Look, the physical science of what we do for a living as a meteorologist is, is getting better and better. The models are getting better, the, the science is good. It's how to communicate all that information. That's what gets really tricky. And one thing I do want to share with you, these are actual quotes from Hurricane Isaac. Hurricane Isaac, so many people didn't think it would be a, a large hurricane because it was a category one. It's not about those categories, it's about the impact. So I do want to share these quotes with you. These came from decision makers during the hurricane, during briefings and, and in conversations. One of them, this is just a Cat 1 hurricane. And I can tell you that the World Meteorological Organization comes up with the names for hurricanes. There has never in history been a Hurricane Justa, and there never will be a Hurricane Justa. There is no such thing as just a Category 1. It's about those impacts. Larger storms, slower storms produce more storm surge, give us more rainfall, and impact our rivers. So we have to watch that. So uh, don't get caught saying that. Take it serious. Listen for the impacts is a big thing that our office does. It's never flooded here before is the next one. And that's one that that can get us. That means it's never uh, impacted you in the past or you, you didn't get hit by that hurricane. And this, this quote actually comes from, from a, a place that uh, the houses were built after it flooded before that. And th that's the type of thing we have to, to watch. So never really uh, think that because you just haven't been hit in the past. So watch that closely. I've been through Hurricane Katrina and Gustav. This is nothing. I urge everyone, please be careful comparing the current storm to the last one. Every one of these is absolutely different. They produce different impacts. We have to be really careful comparing these storms. I saw the news break into programming. That GFS thing says it won't come here. Whew. Well, be careful with that. What that is happening is with social media and, and we have information that's everywhere from television, radio, social media, the internet, you can see the different model runs. And what happens is we see the different models and ready for this, we're picking and shopping for the solution that best fits our personality type. And that's what we have to be careful for. We saw during Hurricane Isaac, people were searching for the track that if they're a very positive type of person, they were searching for the track that took the hurricane to Florida. If they were a very negative type of person, they were searching for the track that always brought it here to uh, bring us all the impact. So be careful. You can find a lot of information out there. Once again, it's all about those impacts and going back to what the hurricane will do for us. This is the same surge forecast as Gustav. I didn't flood then, didn't get hit. So that's another gotcha that we always seem to see. My app has most of the lines way east of here. I like the one that says Clipper. Be careful with that because you have access to a lot of these model runs. The Clipper is not even a model. It's looking at climatology and a typical movement for a hurricane. So be careful when you start looking at that type of thing and know what you're looking at. Again, really easy to shop for the solution that you want if you have all that access. We're going to evacuate for every Cat 1 hurricane from now on. Careful with that as well, because the, the issue is if it's a smaller storm and faster storm, you won't get as much storm surge, but you will get the wind. Every one of them are completely different. All oh, great, I have a GIS map, finally something accurate. Sometimes a pretty picture doesn't necessarily equal accuracy. And be careful with this one. We just had our 100 year storm last year. Um, that, that's not the definition of a 100 year storm. That's something you can look on the internet to educate yourself about. And, and that one there is, is, is really tricky because in, in this case, the quote came from a region that was looking at a, a hurricane coming in and was told this hurricane will be twice as bad as the last one. Well, the last one, they got six inches of water. So they were expecting one foot twice as bad and eventually actually got up to about 15 foot of water. So we have to be careful with those type of things. The Saffir Simpson scale is based on winds only. It's not about the, the impacts of the rainfall, the tornadoes, uh, the river flooding that we get, and, and we look at the storm surge as one of our greatest threats. So be careful when you, you look at that. It's about those impacts. I can't uh, repeat it enough. The National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida looks at all the models, blends those together, comes up with a good track. Our job at the local office for our our area for the parishes and the counties that we cover, for St. Tammany Parish, for instance, we would be looking at the impacts. Here's a peek behind the scenes at some of our screens at the office where we're actually taking the colors here and looking at moderate, high, extreme 
wind forecast, tornado forecast, flood forecast. We're looking at those specific impacts. A couple of these graphics here. Here's another one. For instance, we're looking at the actual wind threat and looking at areas that are going to get the most wind. These are the things that we try to communicate. We get that on the internet for you. We get that on social media for you. We're communicating very closely with the local television stations to be able to get that information out, and the national television stations as well. All of them work to, together very closely with us to get the information out. Another gotcha. I want to talk about the seasonal forecast real quick. We, everywhere we go, I, I, on the street, at meetings, everybody comes up and says, hey, Ken, looks like we're not going to have any hurricanes. It's El Nino, not going to be a big deal. And I want to really caution everybody from saying that. I and mean, you look at last year, we had eight named storms. This year, we're looking at six to 11 named storms. So indeed, an El Nino year, we have fewer hurricanes in the Atlantic. That is a true case. And right now, we're looking at uh, a, a lot of uh, shear. We're looking at Saharan dust over the Atlantic. We have a lot of inhibiting factors when it comes to hurricanes. However, here's the caution. A meteorologist will always have a caution. It only takes one to really have a bad time with these, this situation, and that's what we have to really uh, pay attention to because if you look at history, there has been some, some big storms. As I go ahead and change the graphic, watch this, 1957. A lot of people remember some of the historical hurricanes that we had. Moderate El Nino, we had um, Hurricane uh, Audrey here, Category 4. Notice not a lot of storms over the Atlantic, but look at the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico was very busy with a lot of storms. And I can find other examples as, indeed as well. 1965, Betsy, strong El Nino. Not a lot of storms over the Atlantic Basin, but we got hit with Betsy. 1992, we had Andrew, and the list goes on. I can find lots of examples of El Nino years where we get storms. Let me show you how sensitive these tracks are. We all know 2005 was a busy season for us. Look at the map, just covered with tracks of, of hurricanes. We of course know we had Katrina and we ran out of names. That's one thing that we remember from 2005. Absolutely totally ran out of names when it comes to the hurricanes. So we're pretty familiar with that year, but look at 2010. When I go back and, and, and ask people about 2010, for the most part folks say, not busy, didn't get anything, and, and that's the case. Look at the Gulf of Mexico. Most of the storms stayed well south of Louisiana, and we had a lot of storms out in the Atlantic. But I want to tell you this. It's interesting if you shift the pattern. This is 2014, last year. Not a lot of storms. You see them out in the, in the Atlantic, hardly anything in the Gulf of Mexico. But watch how sensitive this is. If you move the high-pressure system located in this direction here, that's what's steering these storms in the Atlantic take that high pressure, change the pattern, move the high pressure right off the, the coast of uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, maybe over Bermuda, and that high pressure brings all those storms in the Gulf of Mexico. And then 2014 would indeed be a busy season because a lot of those storms would be impacting us. So it doesn't take a whole lot to change the season from not very busy to a busy season. That's why absolutely critical we're prepared every year as if we're going to get hit. That's absolutely uh, critical that we have a family plan to get ready for the next storm. A couple of definitions real quick. I told you I wasn't going to do too much that you could look up on the internet, but this is one just because of terminology. A depression, uh, winds less than 38 miles an hour, and a tropical storm, we have winds 39 to 73. In a hurricane, we look at winds 74 miles per hour or greater. So that's just some definitions. That, that you have when you hear the terminology. Some of the areas that we see hurricanes focus from different times of the year, we're past June. And the reason I want to show this is because the lead time leading up to when we'll have those impacts from these systems changes throughout the year. June, a lot of the storms focus quickly. They develop in the Gulf of Mexico. They start off close offshore, which doesn't give us a lot of lead time before we get hit. July, they're a little further out. By August, you can see the Genesis area, we get a little more lead time, not always. Sometimes we can get Genesis right off the shore uh, of the, in the Gulf of Mexico, and that doesn't give us a whole lot of time. You can see how that changes with time. Let's go to the rest of the hurricane season here. With September, a larger focus, that gets into the peak. You get to the late August, early September time frame. That is the peak of hurricane season where we see the most. October, you start to see a shift. A lot of storms forming south of Cuba, then turning back through Florida. And November, they usually start veering off towards the east, and that's because we start getting the cold fronts move through in the troughs, and that acts to steer the hurricanes back towards the east. So that gives you an idea, but let me tell you, if you go back in time, I always say at every presentation, if you can't see your state, you better be prepared for the next hurricane. This right here is about every hurricane we can think of and, and throw at the map. We put them all on the map, and you can't see Louisiana. So without a doubt, we need to be prepared for the next one. Lead time is great. 
but I'm telling you, we don't always have it. We really need to be careful with this. I do want to go through these, these graphics here because I think this is critical when you look at the past. We think of some of these larger hurricanes as we have plenty of time to, to, to look and, and be prepared, but the case is not, not always like that. Some of these form just offshore. Here's an example, 1957 Hurricane Audrey was not classified a tropical storm until early June 25th, about 48 hours before landfall. In other words, not classified as a tropical storm means it didn't get a name. So we didn't have an Audrey. There wasn't the name Audrey until about 48 hours before landfall. And as you can see, a very strong storm, category four storm with uh, pretty high winds. So that doesn't give us a whole lot of, a lot of lead time. Hurricane Camille, the same situation. If you look at Hurricane Camille, 1969, we look at uh, a very strong storm, category five storm. But look, classified as a tropical storm near Grand Cayman at 2 p.m. August 14th, that's 80 hours before landfall. So not a whole lot of lead time there as well. So that's something else that we need to, need to focus on. Bill, 2003, so it's not just some of those storms in, in the past, it's also some more modern storms that we're looking at the same thing. Tropical depression, 30 hours before landfall. So I have lots of examples just like that, just throwing a couple of them on here. The takeaway from this group of slides is basically we're not always gonna have days and days of lead time. A lot of times I, I meet people that have 96 hour plans, 120 hour plans. I, I've heard as uh, many as hours as 200 hour plans and that's not always gonna be the case. So if you want to in your, your home, your business, your agency, or wherever you work, wherever you live, uh, a good thing to exercise the plan. And if you have a time frame that you need to, to be prepared and, and keep everybody safe, run an exercise, cut that plan in half and see what happens. That's a, it's a good thing to do to test out the plan to see if it works in a lot of these hurricanes that we get down here. Some other things that I want to talk about uh, related to the lead time. This is a real case. I did want to go through a real case. This is Hurricane Gustav. And a lot of us re remember Hurricane Gustav. Pretty significant storm. Came out of, of the, the Caribbean up through Cuba and then into Louisiana with a pretty big impact when it came to storm surge and a lot of winds that took out quite a few trees over in the Baton Rouge area. So there was a big impact to Louisiana. I do want to look at these lines real quick because two lines that you can see on the screen here. The left one is the forecast. That was our forecast. Gustav was consistently a little to the right of the forecast through the whole process. This line to the right here is the actual movement of Gustav. So when you think of forecast error, and we're gonna cover more of the forecast error coming up when it comes to our impacts. If you look at the forecast error, we always think of left, right, stronger, uh, weaker. We think of those type of parameters when it comes to um, the, the error with a hurricane. But in this case, something else happened. And I wanna put that on the screen to, to let you see it so we can go through it. Here's the deal. Forecast position, 1 p.m. on Monday was at this location. The verified position of Hurricane Gustav, 1 p.m. on Monday, up here, inland. So what happened? What happened here, is quite simply, Hurricane Gustav sped up. So there are cases where you'll, you'll think you have another 15 hours, you'll have another 24 hours, but in, in some cases they'll speed up and you'll lose that time frame. So don't cut it too short. Make sure you're prepared way ahead of time because Sometimes these uh, systems have a, a mind of their own. So let's look at what's new and enhanced. These are some things that, uh, just some things to, to remember when we start looking at hurricane season here. And one thing you hear all the time, you hear it from us at the, the National Weather Service, you hear it on the television stations, you hear it on radio, is concentrating on that cone and not necessarily that forecast line. And I wanna go through what that is. This is the cone in 2003. It's a very large cone because the forecast error was much greater in 2003. We have a lot of advancements. We're getting a lot better with where the hurricane's gonna go. That's the big takeaway. And the current cone is a lot smaller. And what that means is fewer people along the coast are impacted because they're not, not as many people have to be evacuated because the cone is smaller. And, that, and that's better. That's a better service to this country uh, with, without a doubt that we can do that. But let's talk about that cone a little bit. This is the cone. And really, when you think of the cone, it is a cone of error. It is not a cone of impact, it is a cone of error. So what we do in the weather service is we take the error at 24 hours, 48 hours, we, we go on in time with the hurricane forecast, we draw the average error of that system, and then we connect that to make the cone. And let's really look at what the cone is. I wanna explain what that is. It's a cone of error, a cone of error, not impact. One third of the time, your hurricane will travel to the left of the line, one third of the time, your hurricane will travel to the right of the line, and something we always have to remember, one third of the time, your hurricane won't be in the cone at all. 
And, and that is something that we have to really watch in these hurricane forecasts. Sometimes they'll deviate right outside the cone. So we don't want to cut exactly the cone um, where we need to be looking at being prepared. I think that's a critical thing. And here's an example of why that is the case. Here is a real example, Hurricane Ike. Uh, big storm headed for Galveston. Hurricane Ike was a very difficult storm for us to communicate to everyone what the impact would be to Louisiana. Because we just had, we looked at Gustav in 2008, then Ike came after, after Gustav. There's the cone headed to Texas. Most people in Louisiana wanted to say, this is just a Category 2, it's headed to Galveston, Texas, no worries. Not the case. Ike was huge. Ike was a very, very large storm that encompassed most of the Gulf of Mexico in size. And look at the impacts. That was the impact to Louisiana. Louisiana had a very large storm surge. We had incredible flooding issues from, from Ike going to Texas. So the impacts could be outside the cone. Watch that. Listen for those impacts. Pay close attention to what those are. Um, a couple of new advancements that, that you have um, in the future. Every single day we have some mapping from our Hurricane Center in Miami. We, we have five-day outlooks. I mean, these, this is something you can look at every single day. We'll look at areas that could be developing, and you look at the red being greater than a 50% chance of pro probability of, of development. A medium chance is the orange, and that's 30 to 50, and the yellow is below 30% chance. Look at those. The X's is where we think the development could be, and then the little hatched area there is where we think it will travel, and that is important to see. This one's interesting. This right here has the X up in Ohio and Indiana, an arrow, and then a circle off our coast. Those are the ones that we really need to pay really close attention to because that means we probably have a cold front coming down from the, the central part of the country up in the east, making its way, and in the summertime makes its way south where it can't go very far because the Gulf of Mexico pushes back, stalls out, we get a low pressure that develops right on that cold front and comes back at us as a tropical system. Watch for those because there's not a lot of notice on those. And that's another example how we need to be prepared uh, really quickly. Let's look at storm surge real quick. I do want to go through what storm surge is. A little bit of science for us. We can't uh, get through this without some, some really cool um, science graphics here. Here's a typical hurricane. And what we have at the surface is strong winds. The, the winds blow right on the surface. And as a result, you push water at the surface away from point C towards point A. The water piles up, actually becomes a little heavier, and actually can sink down. Underneath the water, you can come up with a little bit of a current, a little circular current here that travels underneath the water. And watch what happens with time with the storm surge. So we look in the future, we, go, uh, we look at the sand dunes there, we come forward, the winds are blowing. As you get really close to the shore, you cut off part of the ability for the water to sink. And as a result, all the water is coming in, and more importantly, what happens is it piles up and eventually the water comes up. That's our storm surge. And you have other influences, tides, you have um, pressure influences, you have waves on top of that. When we talk storm surge in the whole next section of this presentation, I'm only talking about storm surge def defined right here. I'm not even talking about winds on, and blowing the waves on top of that. So the water can definitely be higher. As a result, the water pushes up, and that's why we get the storm surge. And the elevations that we have in Louisiana, this is a huge concern. Up top, Louisiana, not a lot of elevation change from where we're living down into the Gulf of Mexico, but if you look down on the bottom one here, you can see different places, the Atlantic coast. You can see places uh, on, on the east coast of Florida have this situation where you have a continental shelf that's a little steeper and the water doesn't come in as far. That's us, and that's why that's one of our biggest threats when it comes to hurricanes in Louisiana, the water pushes very far inland and we have to be prepared well north of, of the coast. That is an important factor. I want to go through storm surge. The next part of this presentation really starts dissecting everything that, that we know about storm surge, the things that you need to know to, to be safe and understanding the threat. There's so many factors that go into storm surge. These are, this is a list. Circulation, where it crosses the coast, the shape of the coastline, direction of motion, the wind strength, how big the storm is, and you're looking at the, the continental shelf, look at all these factors. There's so many different factors that go into storm surge that it makes it one of the trickiest things that we can actually forecast. And I want to take you through some real examples. I'd rather not just leave it at just idle words here. I really want to take you through the examples. Here's a typical one-track hurricane. That's 17 foot of storm surge on the graphic. And I really want to spend the time to go back and forth and look at these things. Again, 17 foot of storm surge, a lot of water. Plaquemines Parish gets trapped. The water gets trapped in the shape of the coastline, gets piled up. The only relief there is Lake Pontchartrain. 
If the storm stays long enough, the water goes through the Wrigley's into Lake Pontchartrain, and that's the water that can impact St. Tammany Parish quite a bit, and any of the parishes around Lake, Lake Pontchartrain and Lake, Lake Maurepas. So look at that, okay? Lake Pontchartrain, 11 foot of water. Now watch this. We're gonna have some science fun by moving this hurricane around. If I move this hurricane to the west by about 30 miles, look at the difference. I've spread out that water. You don't see those high values anymore. Lake Pontchartrain doesn't nearly get the water that we had with the previous track. And in this case, it looks like about three to five foot of water, which for, for the most part, uh, we can handle a lot of that outside of some of the, uh, the rivers and the bayous uh, that we have. But what, what a difference. And now, in contrast, I want to move it the opposite direction, about the same distance. What a major difference. Now we're talking those values again, but now I'm spread out that, that 15 to 17 foot of water over a large area and a big impact also to Lake Pontchartrain. So what, what is the takeaway here? Teeny, teeny movements. Teeny meaning 20, 30 miles. In the case of, of a hurricane, those small movements can have a huge impact on the amount of storm surge that we get on the ground. That there is important. And this goes back to the slide that I talked about. It's never flooded here before. Well, the reality is, if you live in an area like this, it was close, you just didn't get hit. So that's why the preparedness is so critical every single year. And that's just one example of how the hurricanes uh, can produce a storm surge and the small differences in the movement. So what do we do at the Weather Service? Because of those slides that I just showed you, we take an ensemble approach. What does that mean? Well, what that means is I take tons of hurricanes, lots of them, hundreds, if not a thousand in some cases, run a model that covers all of those different tracks and we come up with a storm surge forecast. So when, during a hurricane, when you hear the National Weather Service is forecasting uh, five foot storm surge, we're getting it from this model and we're looking at it in this direction. So this case, this is a category two. Category two at high tide moving two miles an hour. Bad for Louisiana. So a slow storm produces the storm surge we see here. We got about 14 foot, but look at Lake Pontchartrain. Slow storms are very bad for Louisiana because it allows the water to pile up in every nook and cranny that we have, every small area, low elevation. Look at Lake Pontchartrain with the amount of water in there. But one thing I want to show you how tricky storm surge forecasting is. Look at Mississippi. Not good, five to eight foot of water, but mostly contained along the, the coastline there. Watch what happens. I want, to, I want to forward this. This is two miles an hour. This next one, pay close attention. This is 15 miles an hour, the same hurricane. Let me go back. This is two miles an hour. This is 15 miles an hour. Big difference in Lake Pontchartrain. For Louisiana, faster storms don't allow the water to pile up into Lake Pontchartrain. But if you paid real close attention, worse for Mississippi. Slow storms, bad for Louisiana, but the slow storms are worse for Mississippi. It's an opposite effect because they actually get the full brunt of the water with the faster storms. And if that's not a clear enough example, I have one more. Instead of the track coming from the, the southwest, I'm gonna take all these tracks coming in from the, the southeast this is a slow storm again, category two, from the very typical movement from the southeast, um, two miles an hour. Lake Pontchartrain has a lot of water there, 13 foot of water, which is a big impact. Um, when we had Hurricane Isaac, just to give you some reference, we had about eight foot. We had some measurements at 8.2 feet of water in Lake Pontchartrain. So this is a very serious storm for us because it's moving so slow. But look at Mississippi. They're looking at maybe seven foot of water. Watch this. I'm gonna increase this storm again to 15 miles an hour. Look at the difference in Mississippi. They've gone from that seven foot level up to 14 uh, foot of storm surge. Significant difference just by speeding up the storm. And look at Lake Pontchartrain, you don't quite get the storm surge. So that's how tricky these, these systems can be. And it's not easy saying a storm's gonna be five miles an hour or 10 miles an hour or 15. That's really tricky business when we come up with that. So you'll hear us give some ranges when it comes to these, the storm surge. And that way we can uh, help get the information out. So what are we doing? We got some big improvements coming up. Uh, for this year, and I want to go through some of those because you're going to see that on the web. So we looked at one track, not good. Lots of tracks, you can kind of overdo it a little bit because it's only going to be one of those tracks that ends up being the true hurricane. So we have some new things that we're doing that I think are going to be a, a big leap forward. One of them is probabilistic storm surge. Big, big word for basically saying simply this. All we're doing with this to break it completely down is too many tracks overdoes a storm surge, one track is not good because if it moves, somebody will get flooding that, that wasn't forecast. So what we're gonna do at the Hurricane Center, and we're gonna collaborate back and forth between the local office and the Hurricane Center, is we're gonna run a limited number of tracks. That's gonna be a big leap forward, and I'm gonna show you why. 
because if you look at this, we can give you more information that's a little more accurate as we get closer to the landfall. We will issue this and run this model when we're at the watch phase. In other words, we're looking at after a watch or warning is issued, we're going to give more information. And I'm going to show you some of those graphics coming up. Here's an example. I'm going to show you a real example. This is a real case. This is going back in time looking at Hurricane Ivan. That's the forecast track of Hurricane Ivan moving just to the west of Mobile Bay. This is only 12 hours out, by the way, so it really was a, you know, you're thinking it's going to be a, a, a pretty accurate forecast, and, and by the way, it was. Here's a storm surge forecast for Ivan. Mobile Bay inundated, 14 foot of water. Watch Pensacola. Watch Pensacola. Pensacola here, two to four foot of water. Not a good thing for Pensacola, but it looks like they, they could get through that with two to four foot of water. Here's what really happened in real life. That was the forecast track to the left. In actual real life, what happened in hindsight, the track was a little bit to the east. But wait a minute, not far, right? Just across Mobile Bay, not a bad forecast. When it comes to a meteorological forecast, it's a, it's a pretty decent forecast. It's a high five forecast. We don't high five, but that's not a bad forecast when you're a meteorologist looking at way ahead of time. But watch the difference. As I said, little movements, big changes. Look what happened to Pensacola. Pensacola went from that low water level to very high storm surge just with that little movement. And in fact, what happened in Mobile Bay blew a lot of the water out altogether. So as an example, that new storm surge that we'll give you, we will give you probabilities in the case of Pensacola, a 30 to 40 percent probability of getting a greater than eight foot storm surge, that you can do something with. So that's the, the direction that we're going. I think it's really going to help. This is actually what happened, and Ivan blew that water right on out of there. We're going to be doing that in the future, and this is the big result that you're going to have this year. We don't want a hurricane, but if we do get one this year, we'll be ready to issue this map. This is an inundation map. This is actually the way to look at that is this is water up your pant leg. You don't have to worry about converting the numbers. You don't have to worry about anything with this map, except for the fact that it's a water up your pant leg and the different ranges. There's been no product in our agency's history that has more social science vetted into this. In other words, we had town hall meetings, lots of them, to ask people, what do they think of the map? What do they think of the colors? What do they think of the ranges here? And I think that will prove very useful for us in a hurricane. Here's the takeaway on this map. There's a 90% probability of the values on this map being accurate or lower. It is a reasonable worst case scenario because it's not tons of tracks, it's not one track. Every error we can think of is built into this. Left, right, bigger, smaller, faster, slower, everything we can throw at it is built into this map and as a result it won't change from each, each different forecast. You're going to have this when we get into the watch and warning phase. And the last three minutes here I'm going to go through the storm surge warning, that's the big thing that we need to look at. The storm surge warning is brand new. It's a prototype this year. Remember Hurricane Ike? Just a cat too. Going to Galveston, Texas, no worries here. We weren't under a hurricane warning, so it's hard to communicate the impact. With this new prototype, we can say, we don't have a hurricane warning, but we do have a storm surge warning, and that should help communicate the dangers that we have from, from some of these, these uh, storms. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to be a web page, and we'll get that out to you on social media. We'll get that out to you. Uh, the best that we can. I think that's going to be a good way to do it. Speaking of the social media, there's a ton of information out there. Uh, definitely a great way to get information. You look at Facebook, you look at uh, Twitter, get the information. I, I, I can't urge this strong enough. There's a ton of data out there. Have a good source. Be able to watch uh, your, your, the media source that you need to get the information. And I'll tell you, there's, um, it could be overwhelming. And that goes back to the first slide that I had about getting the information knowing how to interpret it. And that's why we're doing this today, is to give you more information so when you hear that, when there's a hurricane near our coast, you can kind of sort through some of that and be able to understand exactly uh, where we're going with this. And this, this last part I'm really proud of. We're, we're one of the few agencies left that you can call 24 by 7 and, and get a human being, talk to us. If you wake up at 2, 3 in the morning, you're just worried about the weather, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. And you, there's a phone numbers that you can call, email us, go to our web page. It's a great way to get information. So as a quick reminder, once again, um, have the information, have a source for this information. Be aware, contact us. And at the National Weather Service, we're extremely proud uh, to be a part of our parent agency at NOAA and be a part of St. Tammany Parish. Come visit us. We're at Slidell Airport. Uh, once again, I'm Ken Graham at the National Weather Service. I'd love to give you a tour of our office. Come see us and uh, let's all be safe this hurricane season. Have the information and I appreciate your time today. Thank you.